The 2020 mortgage crisis and when should you invest? That's the topic for today's episode. And without further ado, let's dive in. Hello everyone and welcome back to Nova Rise. So today's episode, it's a highly anticipated one by all of you. I receive a ton of comments and questions and inquiries about what's gonna happen to the economy, whether we're actually heading towards a crisis and what you can do about it, right? So today I'm gonna take a different approach in comparison to other channels. Why? Because I want you to understand that a crisis doesn't really happen overnight. A crisis is a result of a series of events, cause and effect, that get mixed up over time, leading to what we know it's a crisis. And usually by the time you realize that you are in a crisis, it's already too late for you to take action. So what are we gonna learn today? So first thing, we're gonna learn about the 2008 financial crisis, what actually led to it, and why was it so big and heavily impacted all of us. Then we're gonna understand or learn about what's happening today. How do we wind up in this situation and whether it is actually a crisis or not. And then we're gonna compare the two scenarios side by side so you can learn about the similarities, the differences, and what you can do. And then towards the end, you're gonna get a series of takeaways and actions that you can actually do. One, to protect yourself, two, to help you navigate through it, and third, to help you identify any future crises that are about to come. And without further ado, let's just dive in straight into my computer. And here we are inside my computer. As I mentioned outside, we're gonna start with a little bit of history in a way, so that way we can understand the chronological order of how certain things are happening. And at the same time, I want to educate you so that you understand what comes up before what, so you can adjust accordingly, not just in this crisis, but in future crises going forward. So without further ado, let's just dive into the presentation. So what happened? in 2008, right? So we're gonna start with a 2008 and we're gonna have two points of comparison. We're gonna compare what really happened in 2008 and what does it mean to the crisis that it's happening right now in 2020. So in 2008, everything started all the way back in 1977. Yes, I know, it sounds like it's a long time, but that just goes to show you how long it takes for real estate to, let's say, show changes, right? So in 1977, the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, also known as CRA, was approved. And what does the act entail, right? So it basically was approved to provide opportunity for low-income families to be homeowners, right? They wanted to give everybody an opportunity to own a home, regardless of your, um, let's say, financial background, so to speak, right? So uh, the goal was to increase lending and at the same time, it was also meant to loosen up some of the regulations in the mortgage industry. And before 1977, the losses were actually very low in the mortgage industry due to the high standards, right? It was extremely difficult for people to qualify for mortgages because of the strict lending policies, right? Now, if some of you are either from South America or are currently living in South America and you're watching this video right now, you can actually relate to um, what happened in the US prior to 1977 because that's the current scenario down there right now. Lending is extremely difficult and you are literally signing your life away every time you sign in a mortgage. It, it is a lot more difficult down there than it is here to obtain a mortgage, right? Now, fast forward into 1991, you will still see a low volume of mortgages in the market, but in the mortgage sector, things are starting to get, let's say, creative, so to speak, right? Um, and what do I mean by creative? Well, you as a borrower, what's usually the two main uh, roadblocks or the main uh, things that are preventing you to qualify for a mortgage, right? So one, will be the lack of fund for the down payment. And two, even if you were to qualify for a mortgage, then the struggle, it's typically, I don't know if I'm gonna have enough to pay my mortgage on a monthly basis, right? So what the mortgage sector did is that they started to look into all the possible options to see what product they can create so they can eliminate those two roadblocks and uh, basically just you know, make the products, make the mortgages available for pretty much everybody. 
Then, by 1992, the concept of skin in the game was slowly starting to get eliminated. And if you don't know what skin in the game means, it just basically means the 20% down, right? Because when you put 20% down for the purchase of a property, it's going to hurt you, right? You save that money for a long time versus you walking in and buying a house with no money down. It makes it a lot easier for you to just simply walk away as opposed to having some of your savings as a way to uh, make you feel the pain, so to speak, right? Because you work really hard to pull all that money together so you can finally afford to buy a house. So that whole concept started to go away. And in 1994, Fannie Mae announces uh, their mortgages with only a 3% down. Now, if you don't know who Fannie Mae is, Fannie Mae stands for the Federal National Mortgage Association, and they are the kind, or let's say they're the ones responsible to uh, create a secondary market for the purchase and the sale of mortgages, right? So in a way, they sort of facilitate um, the injection of cash in the mortgage industry, so that way there is always is going to be liquid funds or let's say enough money so the banks can continue to borrow that money to everybody. I have created an episode many months back so what I'm going to do I'm going to leave you a link down in the description below so you can actually check that episode out uh, but don't check it out until after this episode because I want you to continue with the timeline so that way you um, sort of like get the most out of it right. So that was in 1994. And then in 2001, something very interesting happened, and that was the burst of the dot-com bubble. Now, some of you might be too young to even remember that. Uh, so for those who don't really know what happened in 2001, it was just basically um, the fall of the internet business, so to speak. So at some point, everybody wanted to become a computer science. Everybody wanted to go into online business, so to speak. And there was a bubble that was created. And then at that point in time the bubble burst and a lot of people a lot of businesses actually went out of business with the exception of a few and Amazon included in it if anything Amazon became a lot stronger after 2001 and because of all that was happening in 2002 the Federal Reserve decided to lower the interest rates to record low now uh, for those who don't know what the role of the Federal Reserve Bank is in the US economy and to a certain degree worthwhile they are responsible for enforcing the dual mandate and for those who don't know what the dual mandate is it's basically number one ensuring a good employment rate and then two regulating interest rates not just in the short term but also in the long term and of course, because we're having record low interest rates by the Fed, guess what's going to happen? We are hitting a record volume of mortgage origination, right? It sounds very familiar to what's happening right now with all the lending institution. The Fed lowers the rate and then people go crazy trying to refinance their our mortgages or trying to apply for new mortgages because they want to take advantage of the low rate. And then after that, things pretty much just picked up, right? So by 2005, the interest rates and the housing prices were on the rise all the way up to 2008, where we, you know, saw what happened, right? So what makes 2008 so interesting? So in 2008, we didn't only experience a real estate crisis. So what in particular made 2008 a black swan event, right? So we have the banking crisis where the government had to come in and bail Wall Street out. We also experienced the real estate crisis. There was also the fall of the US infrastructure. For example, GM or General Motors having to pull out from Detroit uh, and basically the world right and uh, the fall of Greece and we also experienced massive job losses right and it's true we all experience massive job losses in every crisis but I want you to pay close attention to the type of jobs that were lost at that point in time in 2008 so uh, amongst the uh, pool of jobs that were lost we are talking about the financial district right people um, working in Wall Street people who had experience in the financial industry so for example Lehman Brothers went out of business and the construction industry also experienced massive job losses because at that point in time there was a lot of commercial real estate in the bill there were a lot of flippers on the market because the goal was to supply as many houses as possible and then 2008 hit and everyone had to stop because everyone went out of business and eventually that just simply creates a domino effect and retail got hit as well but as you can see retail was
was not the number one um, marketplace, so to speak, that uh, was impacted. They were impacted as a uh, result of everything that has been happening already. And as you can see, everything from 1977 to 2008, that's a total of 31 years. It took 31 years for this massive crisis to happen. But now let's compare that to what's happening in 2020, right? So we're gonna use the same exercise, we're gonna use the timeline as well. So let's just first analyze what happened with the pandemic, right? So back in November, 2019, we hear of the first case in China. Then in December, 2019, the world finds out. And by January 2020, we hear of the first cases in Italy and USA. So this is expanding rather quickly. Rather than taking years to expand, we're talking about months now. And by February 2020, Trump approves $1.25 billion in preparedness funds to um, address everything that's been happening worldwide. And by March 2020, that's when pretty much the madness took place, right? So we had the Fed lowering the interest rates to now new record lows. We have the stock market crashing. State of emergency was actually declared in the US. And lastly, Congress passes the CARES Act to provide economic assistance to individuals and small businesses, AKA Main Street, right? So uh, for those who have no clue what the CARES Act means, if you've heard about the $1,200 stimulus, if you heard of the $600 unemployment or any of the SBA loans, that's basically what the CARES Act entails. And we also experienced massive job losses. But this time, you see, we have a different industry that is being impacted. We have the hospitality and the tourism industry because travel has been banned to or from certain countries in order to prevent physical contact, physical interaction with one another, right? Same thing happened to the entertainment industry. Theaters started closing down, restaurants are being closed down, bars have been closed down in a way to prevent this uh, massive pandemic to continue to expand. And now we have April, right? In April, a lot of us are applying for EIDL or PPP loans in order to get assistance so that way we can keep our businesses up and running and therefore provide jobs to Americans, right? But I've been hearing rumors that funds are already running out, right? And that there is a potential for another stimulus to come out, uh, including a stimulus to uh, help out the real estate industry. And that's it about the timeline in terms of how quickly this whole situation has spread out. Now let's just analyze what's happening in the job market, right? So in order for an economy to continue to grow, the U.S. has to add at least 150,000 jobs every single month in order for the economy to expand. So now let's just take a look at October and where 185,000 jobs have been added. Then in November, 261,000 jobs have been added. So at this point, we're doing pretty good, right? Uh, we are sort of like in the early stages of economical expansion. But then December 2019 came, and instead of adding more jobs, now we had a dip, right? Now we're adding 147 in comparison to the 261. And we came back up, and instead we're adding 214,000 jobs. And then things continue to grow. And then by February, we're adding 275,000 jobs. So once again, we are seeing that expansion happening. We're adding more than the minimum of 150,000 jobs a month over month, starting in January. But then look at what happened in March. Everything just fell, everything dropped all of a sudden, and that's as of March 12. So that means a lot more jobs have been lost. They're just simply not captured at this point in time. And who knows what's gonna happen in April? How many more jobs are we gonna record in history, right? And all of this only took six months and that's without counting everything that is about to come. So now, once again, let's compare it side by side now, so that way you have all the details in both years. So in 2008, we had an event that was caused by an internal factor, right? Uh, something that happened back in 1977 with the act that was approved in order to provide access to low-income families to the opportunity to become homeowners, and that internal factor was cooking for over 31 years, right? The bubble that was cooking over time was the real estate bubble. And by the time the real estate bubble burst, we had an excessive inventory of properties. We had lots and lots of properties and no one 
with the money or the capability to buy them because of the job losses, because of what happened with the mortgage industry. And at the time, there was also a lot of high interest rates and also the prices of the properties were on the rise as well. And once again, we had what we call the black swan event and where multiple events took place at the same time. And the government had no other choice to come in and rescue Wall Street, right? Which it caused a lot of anger at the time because Main Street was sort of like left out and forgotten about and um, they couldn't really understand why the government had to come in and bail out Wall Street. And in that episode that I mentioned earlier, which I recorded months ago, um, the government really didn't have much of a choice to not rescue Wall Street. Why? Because you remember what happened with Fannie Mae and how they created an opportunity for the second market and where investors could come in and buy and sell mortgages. Well, a lot of those investors were also international investors. We're talking about people from pretty much all over the world who invested their money in U.S. mortgages and and if the Fed didn't come in to rescue Wall Street, we were going to experience something a lot bigger than the recession. We will probably hit a depression at that point in time because the economy of the entire wall would have collapsed because of that. So once again, the Fed didn't really have much of a choice at that point in time. Now, if it were to compare this to 2008, what we're experiencing right now was caused by an external event that only took off in six months. The bubble that was cooking over time was not the real estate bubble. It was the student loans bubble. A lot of students were actually defaulting already on their payment because it became too much. A lot of students were graduating with a high, high, high amount of debt and the jobs that they were getting was not sufficient for them to cover that massive debt that they got themselves into. But because of everything that has been happening and thanks to the CARES Act, a lot of that repayment was actually put in hold and now the students who graduated with that massive debt, they don't have to worry about repaying it until further notice. And because of everything that's happening with the pandemic, we have a low inventory of properties, right? Because a lot of homeowners, they don't want to list their properties and risk the chance of getting germs or getting people who are actually carrying uh, the illness within themselves and then just spreading it all across. And people who are healthy don't want to come out and take a look at houses or anything like that. So it's kind of like a domino effect, right? And at the same time, because anything that required you to physically go into work was also paused, which means constructions had completely stopped because they cannot afford to bring people out there and having the risk to basically just infect one another. So we are currently experiencing a low inventory of properties. And at the same time, because of what just happened with the Fed, we are at a new record low in terms of interest rates. And because of that, the properties are certainly not going to go up in prices. If anything, they could go down. Who knows? We're about to find out. And in this case, rather than experiencing a bunch of events all together, we're experiencing one massive event that is impacting the entire world. But this time around, the government decided to rescue Main Street, the people, meaning small businesses, individuals like you and me, and the U.S. infrastructure as well, because this country cannot afford to completely shut down, right? We need the infrastructure, and that basically translates to some people still having access to their jobs, people still making things happen, people still going out there, transportation, we're talking about nurses, we're talking about companies like Amazon, who are ensuring that all of us who are staying at home can get access to our daily supplies, things that we need on a daily basis. And because of all of this factor, because the government is rescuing Main Street, the demand for housing is going to continue to exist and jobs are still standing and therefore there will still be funds for people or families to pay for rent. So now at this point you will probably be wondering, well, then I don't understand what everybody referring to, to um, a crisis. Like, why are they saying that there's a crisis? Plain and simple, because of two reasons. One, the mortgage forbearance, and two, state and local mandates that are instructing tenants to not pay the rent. Because of this, we're all losing. Why? Because unless the government makes another bailout, quote unquote, most banks that are offering the forbearance program, they want their borrowers to pay the forbearance amount in a lump sum at the end of the forbearance period, which simply means they're not going to be able to do so because they're asking for the forbearance for one reason in particular, 
and that is because they don't have the money. So I'm not sure why are banks thinking that borrowers can actually afford to make a lump sum payment at the end of the forbearance period. And I know there are a few exceptions out there of some lenders who are actually reducing the amount so that way the borrowers don't stop making payments. But for the most part, based on what I've heard out in the street, most banks are actually completely pausing the mortgage payments, but then they're requesting the borrowers to pay all that was paused all in a long sum at the end of the forbearance period. And the ripple effect of that is that within a period of six to 12 months, homeowners or property owners will not be able to meet their financial responsibility, not because they don't want to, it's simply because they can. And that will ultimately lead to the loss of their homes or properties if you are a real estate investor. We will all lose, once again, homeowners or property owners and renters as well because this is the part that renters don't seem to understand. They're probably thinking, hey, I'm the one without a job in the first place, right? But what renters seem to fail to understand is that if your landlord loses the home, the bank will most likely take over the house. And again, the bank is not in the business of real estate. The bank is in the business of making money. They're not gonna take the home away from your landlord and keep it and continue to manage that. No, they're gonna make you move out because that's not their expertise. They're not here to be landlords. So if your landlord is losing his or her property or their property, that means you will be left as a renter, you will be left without a home. And therefore, why would you put your family through that, right? So this is a situation and where we're all losing at the end. So what does that mean for you as a real estate investor? Well, that means that within six to 12 months, loss of properties will be in foreclosure and that there will be a high but very high chance for property prices to go down unless the government decides to take action to rescue the real estate market. And what does it mean for you in particular, you the person who is looking to invest, you the person who is already investing but maybe not knowing what to do next? Well, it means you have to take action now. Why? Because banks are tightening their lending of money. Why? Because they are already issuing bad debt. In other words, they are lending money without collateral or personal guarantee. And those are the SBA loans. Yes, the loans are backed by the SBA, but there's no way for the banks to go after you for a collateral or for personal. It's, it's basically them granting you a new credit card, but for a much larger amount and not have anything in return in the event that you choose to just default in your loan payments. At this point, the banks are only making a 1% gain on the loans they are offering through the SBA. They no longer want to issue more loans because there's a very high probability that they will have a big inventory of foreclosed houses to deal with. So they don't want to go ahead and issue more loans because their hands are pretty much tied. They are super, super busy dealing with all the small businesses trying to apply for SBA loans and probably will even be busier trying to deal with a big inventory of foreclosed houses and their queue. So what is the takeaway of all of this? Well, the first takeaway is that the real estate crisis will get here fast if the government doesn't do anything. The second takeaway is that if you are a real estate investor looking to get funding from the bank, you need to invest right now. Why? Because the banks are slowly closing the doors to new mortgages because of all the reasons that I shared with you earlier. The third takeaway is that if you are a real estate investor who does not need the banks to invest because you either have liquid funds or know of creative ways to invest, then the best moment for you to invest in properties at a bargain will be within six to 12 months. That is somewhere between October, 2020 or April, 2021. And if you don't have any of the liquid funds today, but would like to have them in six to 12 months, then once again, you need to take action now. But that doesn't mean you will be just blindly invest in real estate, right? You have to do it in a smart way. You have to do it in a strategic way, right? And that's by investing in the strategic markets. And if you don't know what am I talking about, I'm gonna leave you a link down in the description below so that you can check out the prior episode to this one and where I teach people, I teach all of you 
where exactly to invest in times of crisis because once again you have to do it strategically but investing in real estate isn't enough to protect yourself you also need to diversify outside of real estate and by that i mean investing in gold silver or even cryptocurrency although for that one there's a steep learning curve and you have to know what you're doing and where exactly to go because otherwise you'll be investing your money in phony accounts where you know they can just walk away with your money right and you need to understand something in here the more dollars are printed the lower the value of the dollar. It basically goes back to the supply and demand concept, right? The more supply is available in the market, the lower the price because there's too much of it. So you need to do something to protect your investment and to make sure it continues to run the proper way. And that is pretty much I have in here. I will see you back outside. And if you're enjoying what you learned so far, Please, please do not forget to hit the like button so that way you can help this episode rank and help other people looking for this type of information. And well, that's pretty much all I have to share with you today. Now, remember, it is very difficult to predict, let's say, with 100% of an accuracy as to what could happen in the future. Everything I share in today's video was basically my research, was basically reviewing and doing an analysis of everything that's happened in the past and then what those historical events can mean in today's date in the event that the government decides to or chooses to not do anything. Anything can change. It's actually too early to tell whether the government is going to take action or not. And if they do, I will certainly create another episode to give everybody an update. And for those who are actually interested in learning about the strategic areas to invest, here is the episode I was telling you about earlier. So feel free to check it out so that it can help you complement everything that you learn in today's episode. And without further ado, I'll see See you guys soon. Take care. Bye-bye.